The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... Please note, the new number is... Always a work in I look so much better in the last recording. Now I look like Elmo. <laughs> There's, um, I forget, I haven't watched much Netflix lately, but there was a show that I was watching a little bit of called, I think, um, I'm forgetting what it was called, but it was pretty much a show that was like an animated version of something along with a podcast, um, right? And it was, I Googled it, and pretty much this, um, the synopsis is that it was this psychedelic podcast that this guy had that pretty much he just did psychedelics with all his guests and had conversations about like metaphysics um, and like life and death and all this. And then some artist heard about it and um, said this would make a great like dark cartoon. And now there is a show on Netflix, which is literally that. So fascinating how things happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember watching, uh, I think the YouTube channel is called Psych Substance. And I think the, he was one of those uh, people on YouTube who would often post like live experiments of people taking um, hallucinogens or MDMA or DMT and just recording them and posting them for educational purposes. Um, I mean, for harm reduction purposes, mostly, because I feel like harm reduction is the only thing that, that seems to hold, you know, significance within pharmacology um, and, you know, how we interact with psychedelics in general. It's, it's not, you know, how people would say it's the fault of the drug. Uh, you know, oftentimes we get to hear the narrative. I mean, that's something that's been happening since 1960s, right? Like we always hear that the drug is wrong, not the, uh, you know, person or the intention, but it is actually the human psyche, right? The unconscious we were talking about before, right? Yeah. It's the, it, it, and the unconscious is so profound and so strong that it has influences beyond the capacities and beyond the things that we can even think about. And so, yeah, that, that's what happens with psychedelics. Like the, the only reason psychedelics get shamed is because they tend to show you the quote unquote real, right? And so if the real is right in front of you, it's intolerable because there is a quote unquote truth, right? In some objective way. And so, yeah, there's like so many ideas bouncing off when oh. psychedelics come into question. It's fascinating, right? Before we were talking a bit about the interplay of language and not with psychedelics, but just the interplay of language and basically the unconscious and understanding the human, right? Because we have all these different intricacies and in how we express ourselves and how things evolve over time. And sure, it could be formalized to an extent, but there are implications that are still being discovered of human language and of the patterns of human language, right? Like even it, considering memes as a language themselves um, and the way that information proliferation shapes society, both in terms of like personal decisions and in terms of things like desire and in terms of markets, right? Because that's the whole point of social media marketing is its influence, right? And it's fascinating, right? Have you read Super Intelligence? Uh, by Nick Bostrom? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I love what he starts that with, the sparrows and the owl, where the sparrows essentially are discussing how to um, evade predation um, by an owl. And they're saying that they can steal an egg and raise their own owl to defend against any other predators, um, like any other owls that are trying to, um, to eat them, right? But there's this question, which is how do you even model, how do you predict what would happen then? Because the owl could also just turn on them and eat them even though they raised it, right? So there's no way to really know until you do it for some things. And that's the case with AGI. And so that, I, I really, that fable really stuck with me because, and this brings us to like narratives as well, because I think that like in the context of natural language processing, there's a lot that can be done that hadn't been possible in the past in terms of mapping narratives to certain quantitative data and trends and culture and in the evolution of language on social media even, right? Like phrases and memes on Twitter could tell us a lot about different cultural events that perhaps if the revolution were going on, it would be, um, telegrams and people riding around on horses, right? 
And we don't have that data from back then. We have some records, but revolution now happens at a faster pace and history progresses at a faster pace. Like one day's data to the next, the narratives that are trending change, right? And so we now have this opportunity to understand language at, to take it back to the unconscious level, the individual unconscious level in terms of personalization and discovery, but also the collective unconscious level in terms of groupthink and in terms of basically trends in the meaning of different phrases in context, even map to a geographical location or multiple geographical locations. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of rambling. I ramble sometimes. I really love it because here's the thing about the confluence between computation and like the unconscious, right? Like I recently discovered this thing about Carl Jung that in 1959, he published this essay about flying saucers, which is UFOs. Like how crazy. At first time, Carl Jung yeah. About it. I was like, what? You know, and then I looked up into it and it turns out that he commented a whole bunch. He said that this entire UFO situation is related to, you know, some sort of a cosmological change and somehow is rooted in your conscious. And it's, it's crazy to see, you know, again, the influence, right? Like the influence of the collective unconscious or even the personal individual unconscious to, you know, direct human behavior. And moreover, that human behavior just extends into the cyberspace. I mean, that's what we see happening with us creating this AI, right? Like this need or urge to create another of one of us, like the ultimate goal seems to be able to create sentience, right? Like that's what we have our yeah, intent. For human nature is humans want to play God. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like the super intelligence that we're trying to reach is literally us creating sentience again with this cognition element, which surpasses us. So it's like we're taking this mythological God and we're also taking this mundane human and we're just combining it together. And this is, you know, what we're trying to thrive after. It's crazy. Well, that's like the ultimate innovation, right? Because it's like, once we can create life, that becomes mundane. It's like, if you think of hype cycles and markets and in funding for things and in terms of innovation, and, and things heading towards um, being just like obsolescent. Um, there are phases. And I think that humans have existed for such a time and technology has progressed us to such a point that any innovation can kind of, to some degree, if you think through things from like a first, first, first principles perspective, you can find a way to test, right? And like, it might not get you there right away, but like enough iteration with scientific method and especially with advances in AI that are currently in progress and with the speed of that, it's like, we can define multiple new Moore's laws, right? Um, for different fields, right? And as things even um, converge, right? Like with quantum computing and with AI, maybe we're not gonna have quantum computers right away, but like quantum machine learning right now and the impact of information theory. Um, and even just the fact that conversations about that are being had on social media does a lot for basically the speed of progress in understanding um, human communication, right? And like everything becomes data that then can be fed into machine intelligence. Like GPT-3 is fascinating for this reason, right? And what's more fascinating is, and this is something that I might get some shit for, but when I found out about copy AI, right? I was very intrigued about that because there's this effect where the more you rely on an external technology to do a skill that you could do yourself if you kept up the practice of that skill, the weaker, the more your brain atrophies in the neural pathways that are activated for that skill, right? Like people say the idiom, like it's like riding a bike. Well, to an extent, we do have something akin to a muscle memory neurologically in terms of um, synaptic patterns that we associate towards certain events or even with language, right? There are studies that have been done in um, neuro 
linguistics, I believe, or it's psycholinguistics. I'm remembering the name of a course. It was a course in undergrad that I took that I read this paper in. So that's why I'm like, no, it was psycholinguistics. Um, but there are studies in that, that where you have people who are bilingual in Australian Sign Language and American Sign Language, and you show them words on a screen. And then you have people who know either Australian Sign Language and Amer or American Sign Language. And obviously both of them also know in written form um, just reading English. Um, so when you show them and then you do fMRIs, um, the patterns, the ability, also the speed at which they're able to answer tasks related to a word, the ones where there was um, some similarity, like some alternative meaning to a word um, in the spoken language, we're able to qu switch quicker between the signs in the associated language than the ones from the alternative. I think I'm like butchering how I'm explaining this, but pretty much it's like the encoding of concepts in the brain is such that like there really is such like a muscle memory for the associations between things, even in how we associate words. Um, and it affects our speed in terms of like reacting to meanings. And that's where it gets interesting with different modes of communication too. I could go on about this, um, but. I mean, you're talking about muscle memory, right? Like we can connect that to um, uh, in involuntary movements, like how uh, are we able to sustain the muscle memory of involuntary movements that are highly unconscious in nature? Like that could be a very good resource question, right? Like that's something that's fascinating. So actually, have you heard of the Intel Science Competition or the um, Intel ISAF? Uh, the Intel ISAF, no, uh, tell me more. It was a science competition that is hosted for high schoolers internationally. So basically I did research um, going into senior year to enter that. I ended up placing really well in it, but um, that's besides the point. What I was um, really intrigued by, and this was something I did at Harvard Vision Sciences Laboratory, was basically the role of preparatory information in competitive interactions via the human computer interface, right? Because where I did the research, they had been doing this study into the role of preparatory information in competitive interactions between human and between two humans, basically. And the way that they had been measuring it is there had been studies into the role of biomechanical action cues um, in the split milliseconds before an action is taken that like help you anticipate and react like almost unconsciously to an extent um, to stimuli. And there have been studies that have been done in why athletes are able to have those quicker split second reaction decisions than non-athletes. Like for instance, professional, professional soccer goalies had faster reaction time in certain lab-based tasks than everyday people, right? Um, and there had been studies like that, but there hadn't been any in a closed environment. So they were doing a study in terms of like using um, GoPro to measure on a plexiglass screen reaction times as well, like in the video to a lab member reaching for a target. And they had done iterations where they covered certain parts of the body, um, where they basically flashed something to obscure the information. Um, and so it was fascinating because I want to know if the results that they had found would continue if you had um, a computerized opponent, right? So using the data from the GoPro videos I created on MATLAB, um, Wow, MATLAB, that was, that's a memory. <laughs> um, but an automated opponent where it would basically be on a trackpad at first and then with a mouse where I had participants essentially reach for different things and I cut out the video frames of the automation and measured the reaction times. And I found that like in those competitive interactions over a human computer interface, you still had that same effect. And it's fascinating, right? Because that's from a video perspective. Also, the other interesting thing is that, and this was, it was a really small sample size. So I wouldn't call any of this, um, I wouldn't call any of this like, <laughs> necessarily like um, able to be replicated. But I mean, I, I wouldn't hope it is, but like I wouldn't bet my life on it. You know what I'm saying? Because it was a small sample size, but for like a high school research thing and for something where it was like a topic that there wasn't any research into, 
I don't know. I, I, st I still feel proud of that, but um, I don't know. But so basically what I found also in the interviews, like in the posts, the debriefs, um, is that people who played video games had faster reaction speeds on average. And it's interesting because you could consider gaming a sport to an extent, but is there a trade-off between, and this brings me back to what I was saying before about um, where I kind of am iffy on over-reliance on things like copy AI, um, because there's this effect that once you start using GPS, you start relying on GPS. And so your natural navigational skills in your brain start to atrophy. Um, and I've noticed that in myself as well. So like to read about it, I think it's like, it makes complete sense. Um, but it's interesting. It's like, I am worried about automating too much of language because of that. Though I'm also passionate about and fascinated by the intersection of how we can understand trends in human behavior and how we can understand language um, in a way that the human brain isn't capable of. So there's those two sides to the same technology with natural language processing, which also brings it back to the point of the fable and superintelligence, right? Um, but I think that there's more of a problem with alignment than there is with the risk of AGI being more powerful than humans, right? Because I think that humans are headed towards, and this isn't me being pessimistic, this is just me being realistic. I think that humans are headed towards a bunch of existential questions within the coming century that if we continue to be focused simply on um, financial profit, and I'm not saying this in like, for me, I, my, I, my political affiliation is let's just solve problems <laughs> pretty much. But I'm saying that like a lot of things get politicized and a lot of things get marketed as being these huge breakthroughs, right? And I'm not saying that in a bad way because I think that any feat of engineering is important to society. But I think that there are certain questions that are going to be coming up sooner than we anticipate with the current rate of technological progress. And we need to pay better attention to how we progress technology forward. Um, and I don't know, I'm not saying that from a place of like ego or from a place of like, oh, I'm whatever. It's just something that I worry about sometimes. Um, but I think that like this year especially, we had a bit of a wake up call with the pandemic. Oh yeah, it's it, like that's what I was gonna say. It's it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Like the old saying. So to keep the ethics in mind and to keep up how we're gonna progress with technology forward, like we need to have the precautionary intention, right, behind whatever we we are creating as humans. Because I feel like yeah, one one of the more co uh, key or core elements of being human is to create something. Is 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 this right towards creation? It goes back to what we were saying about how like human nature is to want to play God. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, one of these, another interesting thought would be, uh, you know, how decision making things in automated uh, machine learning works with person. Oh right like um like uh, um, i mean it is automated so it does not have a personal bias uh, at the moment but if we were to take a very futuristic turn and say that we create an asi of some sort um and it it it, it would have personal biases it would have all of these unconscious influences that we were uh, talking about before and so in these futuristic context uh, context we, we we could also start devising more ethics for you know what it means to have an asi like there's a book about AI ASI, but now we need to have an ethics for ASI, because if we are on this, you know, very crazy progressional trajectory of advancements of technology, it's like, how, how are we being, not being careful, but also being careful about it? Because again, we talk about technology, but technology is interwoven with entrepreneurship, business, you know, all these other sectors, it's the confluence of everything. Exactly. It's like infinite games interwoven. And we're not really paying attention from a data perspective, right? Like if you look at statistics, if you look at current research, we typically try to isolate trends. And I think that that's important, of course, because we need to be able to separate signal from noise. But there are so many intricacies in even the error term that we will never be able to capture simply using um, human methods. 
right? And so that's where I think the progress that we're having in AI is so important. Um, and what we'll be able to do in terms of just even understanding human genetics, and we were talking about this briefly, like in terms of like whether there's a language of epigenetics um, that you could measure pretty much, or not measure, but that you can formalize to an extent using data that we now have from the human genome and from so many other medical databases. And I think that that's amazing. Um, and I think that even considering the ethical questions in the area, um, there are going to be a lot of convergences. And this is just like, I don't, I don't want to like be, oh, I'm, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm just like, this is just sometimes stuff that I think about. But like, I think that there are going to be a lot of convergences in what we can do with understanding um, biological mutations and understanding mutations in spoken language. And I think that it's fascinating because that brings us to what we were talking about before about like the church Turing thesis and about um, <clears throat> about Lacan. So your friend before um, and I, we were having this conversation about Lacan who tried to mathematize Freud um, and he tried to create, he just went through, he got a lot of shit. <laughs> Lacan got a lot of shit. He was um, called out for being an intellectual imposter in Sokol's book, Intellectual Impostors. Um, and Chomsky called him a charlatan. Um, but basically what Lacan tried to do is he was self-taught in a lot of high level mathematics. Um, so he was self-taught in topology and in set algebra and in basically um, formal languages. Um, and he tried to mathematize psychoanalysis such that you can map an understanding of the psychoanalytic brain. Um, and it's fascinating. So I had this idea last June when I was in two courses at the same time. Um, when I graduated University of Chicago, this was my last quarter, so it was like the COVID quarter. So it was great to have both of these online because when I did the readings, um, I was really more tuned to the overlap in certain topics. So one of the courses was Economics for Everyone, and it was taught by Stephen Levitt and John List. Um, and the course was essentially behavioral economics as like an introductory level. Um, but at the same time, I was taking this course, Thinking Psychoanalytically, which was pretty much a lecture series um, on the theme of psychoanalysis and how it applies to different developing fields within sociology, within genetics, within poetry even. Um, and what I found fascinating is the readings on Lacan I was doing around the same time as the readings on von Neumann. And reading the introductory um, book that essentially created the justification for game theory and then began to develop it, um, I saw a lot of similarities in what Lacan was trying to do with Freud. And it's fascinating because we think that marketing drives everything today, but it seems as though marketing drives everything like for the extent of history, even within intellectual communities, right? And that's something that like even the highest level theories aren't going to acknowledge in the mathematics yet. And the only way that we can really understand the impact of influence on markets is to understand the basically mathematics of how information affects the human psyche. And so it's fascinating, right? Because it's like, perhaps, sometimes I like to think about like alternative timelines and what might've happened and different things, but it's, it's dangerous to go down rabbit holes there. But um, I was saying this before, um, if Lacan had succeeded in mathematizing and he jumped from thing to thing, like originally he was trying to develop an algebra of um, psychoanalysis and then he started with the topology and everything was like half finished, right? But he still published a bunch with it. And that's why people called him a charlatan because they just said that he was like dressing up unfinished work. Um, and which is, I believe that there's something to be said about that, but I don't know. Like, maybe that's just, maybe that's just me. I'm trying to get better with doing things that are like, that I'm not completely content with, but I don't know. Um, I essentially, what was I saying about the Lacan thing? Yeah, so I like to think about if Lacan had succeeded, would the church Turing thesis not only be uniting the work of Chomsky um, in terms of grammars, not necessarily directly, but like 
um, as an alternative effect, right? An unintended consequence in a sense. Um, basically it united regular expression parsing and formal grammars um, because there are distinctions that can be drawn between types of automata and basically classes of formal languages. It's fascinating. Um, but basically I wonder if Lacan had succeeded whether there would be a psychoanalytic perspective included in the equivalence classes, right? Because if you have these different things that have these unrelated, um, I don't want to use the word synchronicities, but in a sense they're synchronicities until you can mathematically prove the relation, um, which is what the church Turing thesis essentially did. But between different fields, which I think we still have a lot today, right? Like there are things in physics that can be applied across multiple things. Like it's already being done in economics. Deep learning at this point is heavily dependent on higher level physics. Um, or not necessarily dependent, but there are lots of crossovers, and that's why you see a lot of people who studied physics also doing work in advanced machine learning and advanced deep learning, right? Um, and I just think that we're almost due for another church Turing thesis in a sense, but it's going to be many more things um, along the lines of languages and along the lines of the actual implications. It's like we have gone through a revolution already in terms of understanding the base level of human thought and of computational capability um, and of what can actually be done by a machine. But there's something that's beyond what we can have an AI do. And so that's where I kind of, and to bring it back to the whole thing with dependence, that's where I kind of am with it, right? Because like I had gone through a time where I was like using the GPT-3 playground just basically to test everything out. And then like after a while, I just like got paranoid and started handwriting everything again. Um, because I feel like sometimes when you rely on certain things, like when you rely on a calculator to do math, like you sometimes lose your ability to just like do mental math. And I'm naturally, like I was not naturally very good at mental math, but I taught myself kind of when I was younger. Um, and I got better through practice through that. I was like a weird kid who would just be doing that when I was in the car. Um, <laughs> Like, I would just be like, six times eight. <laughs> no. Um, but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not no. Yes. That was me. Um, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, but yeah, so I think I essentially think that there are more equivalences between physics that we could find with information theory and other dimensions of language that we now have data for from Twitter, from different forums, and more so with decentralization. Um, because with decentralized marketplaces, everything is almost built around mathematics to start. So it becomes more easily machine understandable. Um, and that's something that I'm super excited for. Because I think if you think about things from an information theoretic perspective, everything is going to affect other things as well, right? Like we were talking about human networks a bit before. I don't think on this recording, I think when we were speaking earlier. Um, but there are networks, like there are network effects in social networks, right? Like in terms of predicting whether or not somebody will have a certain trait, there are studies that, and I'm not somebody to just say that like everything is, that everything generalizes, but it's interesting to see what's found even in individual studies, right? I don't know. I'm somebody who still likes to read scientific papers. I know a lot of people don't do that, but um, I don't know. But there's studies with this that show that like, basically if you look at human networks, um, and also if you take into account a lot of social neuroscience in terms of basically learning, social learning, and in terms of basically bias, like when you're isolated versus when you're socially immersed, um, you have network effects of different traits being more, basically more readily adapted when you are close to other people who have them, right? And you could see that not only in what the studies talk about, which is like in small circles, like if you are close to another person, um, then you are more likely to take on their trait by, I think, I think 45%. Um, so for instance, if somebody gets divorced and then you might tend more towards divorce. Um, but 
I think that more so on an ecosystem level, right? Like even if you think about units, right? And this is interesting because I was having a conversation with somebody earlier um, about the legal definition of an organization. And it's, I, I forget the exact term, but it's like a legal person. An organization is a legal person where there's like a natural person, which is the individual. And it's interesting because you could actually think of it even in the psychoanalytic perspective of us being agents and environments and us having to choose what choice from, even if you think of it as like a drop down menu of like, do you want to eat this thing? Do you want to fight this thing? Do you want to run away from this thing? That pretty much that's what psychoanalysis says humans are. We're just like agents and environments where we're interacting with everything and choosing whether we want to mate with it or whether we want to try to fight it. Um, and that's beautiful um, because that's life. Um, but no, <laughs> sorry if I'm rambling again. No, no, no. These are the instinctual drives, right? What Freud talks about, these these needs, these urges, these drives to either satisfy your, um, you know how Maslow talks about the hierarchy of needs, you know, your basic needs, or to satisfy your libido, which is again, you know, the Freudian core. Yeah, and, and so all of these urges, these needs, these um, uh, all of these things can be reduced to instinctual drives, uh, ultimately. And also, like, uh, I've read uh, Lacan briefly, I've skimmed through Ecri, and I've, I've seen, you know, his graphs and the graph of desire, and like all of these graphs, like, uh, I, I see immense value in, you know, visualizing things, right? So there's information that we take in, and how do we process information? You know, there are often questions like, oh, what uh, language do you think in? Or how do you think? Do you think in images? Or are there just words? You know, every yeah. human distinct in nature right so then this data visualization question comes in AI right like as to how accurate data is and but we have to understand that the core of uh, data is visualized first in the psyche um, and uh, then we can ask all these deeper questions whether info uh, graphics or uh, you know ethically correct or legit or not you know and that's the fascinating thing, right? Like we're relying on all of these heuristics and practices, even on a governance standpoint, right? And up until recently on an economic standpoint, um, essentially that were developed on the basis of theories that did not take into the in account, that did not take into account basically the data that we have today on human nature and on the way certain things actually function. So it, it's fascinating, right? Because even from the perspective of how we communicate and how we best organize society, there is data now that we can use to update our theories and to update our practices. The ethics on that come down to basically accuracy of the algorithms, accuracy of the data. Um, basically, there's there are a lot of ethical questions involved, but ethics aside, from like a rational perspective, we have the means to essentially better understand human nature on a neurological level, basically to test psychoana um, psychoanalytic theories through actual fMRIs um, and through experiments that parse human thinking in different contexts, um, like moral thought experiments. If you have fMRIs, um, I read a paper where they did a, it was called like the speed of moral thought. And essentially it was this research that I might have been conflating this because I might have read these two papers the same week, but there is research that show that people who are diagnosed for that test for psychopathy, like being a psychopath, um, are able to react to like ethical questions. Like if you're shown a video of somebody being hurt and you have to respond like what the most empathetic responses or something along those lines, they're able to do it amongst like the top quartile of people who do not test for psychopathy, right? So psychopaths are able to react to the same speed, but the area of the brain that's associated with moral thought and with moral decisions doesn't light up. The area that's associated with pain lights up. And that's what's fascinating, right? Um, but it's interesting because there are always these exceptions and there are these standards that we enforce in society or even in education, right? Like if we talk about 
I'm, my great uncle's 91 years old and he was left-handed, but when he went through school, um, his teachers always said like left-handed was like the devil or whatever. So they forced him to learn how to write with his right hand. And the same thing happened with my grandma, right? And it's interesting, right? Because these cultural beliefs affect trends in society. They affect what we deem as valuable and they affect what's desirable. And that moves markets in one hand, not that left-handedness would, but like we were talking about essentially the impact of influence on markets and the impact of influence on understanding, right? Like how Chomsky even branded Lacan as a charlatan and how Sokol, who is a respected mathematician um, in his book, Intellectual Impostures, basically called out Lacan for using highly advanced um, terminology in mathematics um, in really loose contexts to gain a following of people who just wanted to believe him because he sounded smart, which I think is something that still goes on today. But it's interesting because you could take the perspective that take the idea and not the fact that it's not finished. Um, or you could go with the perspective that you shouldn't use terms that can only be loosely applied, though all of this goes back to language. And that goes back to what we were talking about before we started recording, which is that so much of social trends and so much of social progress, not in like a social justice context, but just in terms of like the actual changes in consensus beliefs can be mapped to changes in different understandings of phrases and the way things trend in different groups and communities that then can affect group decisions, consensus reality, and shift actual progress through politics, through markets, through um, policy, which there's, and this is what I find fascinating, is now there's a split between policy and politics, which I think is a beneficial thing, but that's to be determined by history, um, or I guess the future. Uh, I really like the conflation point of, um, you know, the computation world and, and psychoanalysis. For some reason, it's beautiful. Like you were talking about the fMRI thing, right? I have this brilliant idea. Why not like we do fMRI and all of these conducted things when, within psychoanalytical um, like framework. So maybe taking EEG machines because the fMRI and MRI are bigger machines. So maybe that won't work, but wh why not plug in an EEG machine into a, um, a, an, an analysand or a subject and make them go through a psychoanalytical three to six months you know, treatment and, and see how, you know, these transference or projection, these things were these, you know, subjective theoretical things that are unexplainable. They have subjective bias to it. Because if we try to figure out what projection really is, like if, if from an EEG standpoint, if we can map it out, what projection really is, like well, what, what's happening within the neural pathways when we are essentially projecting our shadow self or the different elements of our psyche within our conversations, right? I love that you said the shadow self thing because that's the other thing is when you think about, and this is something that often gets tossed to the side, when you think about what things are named, there's a great irony in names of companies of different things, especially when you think in context. Like the fact that pretty much anything you Google is probably the name of a startup says something. Like companies mapping to language and language mapping to the use case or to something that is somehow tangentially related or not related, but becomes related just because it becomes the association with either a product or what something does. It changes language and the use of language is how humans communicate and collaborate like if even if you go to the biblical myth of like the tower of babel like we're like that with everything we do and the core of most problems in society is miscommunication i believe um miscommunication and also just decentralized belief that isn't fully understood and that comes back to like decentralization and the unintended benefits that i think that we can see if we continue down 
the same line of technological progress that we are with AI, um, as well as pay attention to more quantum information theory um, and the study of information proliferation with weights, um, especially in the context of social media. And also, if we continue down the line of decentralized systems um, and we see decentralized economies emerging, because we get data from that on human nature at scale that Lacan didn't have and that Chomsky didn't have and that pretty much anyone who's been fundamental in the development of our understanding of languages, not even languages in the context of like spoken language, but in the context of like sets, right? Like if you think about the formal language definition of a language, um, then we probably have more tiers and more layers of language classes than we currently acknowledge. And it's interesting because, and this is something I think about a bit, um, different verticals and different markets, if you look at marketing within them, there are different language patterns that map to different target demographics that you can probably predict, even without AI, just by just like rational reasoning, um, the um, target demographic from the language of the ad. And that's more meaningful than we could think. Because like you could think about the meaning in that from a marketing perspective, but you could also think about what that tells you about the actual effectiveness in terms of engagement of the ad. And you could see what that means in terms of human unconscious beliefs and human unconscious understanding and human unconscious decision making. Um, and using that with decentralized data, you get even more accuracy because you get votes and decisions like that within communities. And for the most part, whether or not it's recorded, which I think is a huge opportunity in terms of using natural language processing for topic modeling in funding discussion and DAOs, um, but that's a whole other conversation. But um, you get basically the map of finan sorry, <laughs> financial trajectories over time to the actual topic modeling in group discourse, either within certain communities or within certain um, social environments, or even within entire networks. Like for instance, like Twitter versus Clubhouse versus um, Reddit, you'll have different trending things, but you'll have some crossover, right? And where Web3 takes it is that it brings in economics as well. So it becomes so cool from a data perspective because you can think of it as memes moving markets, but memes being a formal language in a sense, and then memes spurring more generative languages. Like it's almost, it's almost formal languages, but generative formal languages. And that can map to different machine learning architectures here, or deep learning architectures, sorry, right? And so, I don't know. What I'm really excited about here is the potential for A, another church Turing thesis. Um, by that, I mean like mapping the equivalences of different computational, um, the different computational classes, right? Um, and basically being able to show what can be computed on a machine. Um, but something like that in terms of mapping what is human potential or human potential for discovery or human potential for development within different language classes and then mapping that to economic trends, right? Because if you can understand at the level of what drives consensus decisions um, and you can understand at the level of what drives individual decisions with more advice, uh, with more advanced AI as well, um, then you can develop almost like a with hardware as well, with um, advances in AI chips and also with advances in quantum computing because whether it's one or the other, the fact that both are progressing, whether they end up working in tandem in some larger machine or whether they have a breakthrough in one end or a breakthrough in the other end, um, like whether we're on quantum architectures or not, um, something, the fact that we have research going into the area, there will be a convergence between the hardware capability 
and there will be um, and the capability of algorithms, right? We already have research into infinite category theory for the representation of language um, within a quantum natural language processing framework. Um, but I don't know. I think just the fact that we're drawing more attention to the area is promising simply because there's so much still to be discovered. Like even in terms of um, Robert Schiller wrote this book, Narrative Economics, that was critiqued because it didn't include much quantitative justification for theories that narratives move markets. But I think that that's something that is even doable now in terms of even looking at like Wall Street bets data and meme stocks. Like if I had to bet the next Nobel Prize, not the next, but within the next few decades, there will be Nobel Prize winning economic research that involves Reddit data. Um, that would be a bet. <laughs> And I don't know, I feel like it's interesting to see how society is progressing in terms of group think and in terms of the effects of that on language and the effects of that on basically AI, because even if you think of like GPT-3, it's trained, and I know it's not technically trained entirely on web crawls, there are different weights in terms of what data is taken um, more with higher weights, basically. Um, but it's data from the internet. And what we do on the internet is going to affect the future of the data that we train models on. The thing about generative structures that you were talking about and implementing them into computation, right, um, of language is something with speech recognition, so I would say um, automated ML systems like Siri, you know, maybe. And But when I look at the condition of Siri now, um, it seems very far reaching that we would be able to accomplish uh, uh, an alliance between the unconscious, um, you know, with uh, the decentralized uh, aspect. Uh, so it seems very far fetched. It seems very far away because it seems like C doesn't work properly at the moment. We talk about an AGI, but we don't have a very working efficiently or sufficiently enough working AGI. Uh, we, we're still trying to map out a good AGI structure, right? Um, and then you know, I often think about this other element other than speech recognition is facial recognition, right? Facial expressions, like Darwin would often say that facial expressions and communication via facial expressions is innate, right? It's an innate human tendency to have that kind of facial expression. Like there's entire child psychology and developmental psychology behind, you know, how kids would also have some sort of, uh, you know, facial expression, like the only uh, way an infant would communicate, right? With in the first two years of its existence is within, you know, it's a sensory motor stage, you know, they're communicating via senses. But we often see that, you know, it's not only valid for the children itself, it's also valid throughout our lifetime, the facial expression has just become a thing. And now we have, you know, face identification within uh, automated systems. So I was wondering, what do you think is, you know, the future of maybe facial expression as opposed to speech recognition? Yeah, so I think what's really interesting is thinking in terms of multimodal data, right? Like you have different things in terms of identification and verification of who you are and whether you are who you say you are. Um, but in terms of using data from basically tracking of facial movements and data from biomechanical movements um, in tandem with data from speech, I think that there's a lot to be done um, in multi-factor, basically multi-factor identification. But again, this is like doing stuff like that opens the door to deep fake generation as well. Um, but I don't know, all progress is going to create problems to some extent, but it's about what problems we want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just writing them because like this is a, a re really good chain of thought that um, you know, everything comes with a, a pro comes with a con, like everything kind of depends on this principle of polarity. So, you know, there's hermetic principle that there's a principle of polarity that, you know, um, every emotion has two different polar feelings. So, you know, sadness and happiness is one and the same thing. They're just two polar extremes, right? So we can think of it as pros and cons. Like we create one thing, it's going to have one ethical implication, it's going to have another moral implication. We would mm -hmm. No, completely unaware of it. So, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. 
No, sorry. And this takes us back to what I was saying about um, the basis of psychoanalysis pretty much being that it's almost the same as the basis of reinforcement learning, or actually it's the exact same, which is that we're agents in environments and we have to make decisions on how to navigate the environment based off of the data that we've encountered so far and what we learn from that. And it's fascinating because that's exactly what you're kind of saying, right? And you could even map out like a topology. And this is what I think Lacan is really trying to get at is like a topology of the mapping of meaning in the human psyche and how that maps to decision-making. And that in tandem with something like game theory um, could help us better understand the nature of narrative spread and its effect on outcomes. Um, even in terms of just understanding what phrases get more clicks from like a very basic perspective, but understanding things, and that's not where I think our research should be, frankly, but like, who am I to say that? Um, to more things like understanding why in certain demographics, language progresses at rates parallel to other demographics through certain world events. Um, and something like that could even tell us something about navigating wars or navigating conflict analysis or, or navigating world peace. Like, here's the thing is like, data is only what it's used for, um, or data is not only what it's used for, but data is potential to be used for other things. And the direction that we take with research on the data that's being generated by all the progress that we're seeing right now is going to say a lot about the future of humanity. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's exciting because no matter what we do, there are going to be unintended consequences and there will be unintended problems that we see. But I think that if we can figure out, and I think we're doing this right now in terms of um, furthering research into AI and into more advanced use cases in terms of like decision assistance, not necessarily decision automation, because I think human in the loop systems are super important, especially for feedback and for generating future versions of systems. Um, but in terms of AI assisted decision making, I think that we're getting a lot of great data now that we can then see if it generalizes to a group level. Like it's almost like the distinction between um, classical physics and quantum physics we now have the capability to understand the mapping of human decision making in real time on like a user interface because we all carry around our phones right because we're all carrying around these little data collection machines which could be a scary thing or it could be something that we use for research that benefits humanity and i think that there's there's a lot of in between as well but those are the two poles like you were saying um and i think that the research that we can do on the mapping between the speed of human decision making, the language that's used, um, trends in markets, trends in trends essentially on social media, um, how that differs in different um, modes of content. So for instance, whether there are different things being discussed in audio rooms than in text forums and whether even in terms of like DAOs, we now have self-identification, right? Like, you can see memes about people joking about pronouns or about like choosing gender identity. And it's like, say what you want about things, but you have now data if you so choose to use this as such on the correlation of different traits, different interests and self-identification, right? Like everything is data to an extent. And like I said, like we can use that data for furthering the data that we have for the sake of it, or we could use that data for basically understanding what we already have garnered the capability to learn about the mapping of human nature and general trends and consensus reality within different communities even. Like if you think about um, a changing intercept even. Um, or we can just generate more data for the sake of generating more data, which is not a bad thing because I believe, and maybe this is just optimistic, I believe that everything is going to be used at some point if we so choose. Otherwise, we're just kind of creating an ever going black hole um, of information. And that's something that like we were talking about before in, um, it's very Baudrillard, right? In, um, oh, I always butcher the name. It's simulacra first, simulacra and simulation, which is, he says, the procession of simulacra is going to um, overtake the real such that we can't tell the real from the fake. And I think that happens even on a personal level, right? Like everything is kind of a psyop.
because whether or not you intend to learn from something, your brain is not an ever state of stasis. Like you will be using synaptic pathways um, and it will be firing based off of what you encounter, um, whether it's conscious or not. And it's fascinating because like we said, even with like Neuralink, we'll now have the capability to understand humans at a deeper level. It, it, it's interesting. We were talking about this before as well. It's like, we think that we're in complete control of our bodies and that's a natural thing that we want to think um, because humans like to play God. And that's not a bad thing. I think that that's where a lot of creativity comes from is the idea that we believe ourselves capable of bringing something new into existence, um, which is a great thing. But even like that, understanding things like that with a data repository in the brain and being able to understand whether we really do have differences in even the energetic firings um, from individual to individual or whether there are some like base patterns that we can even map in human to human interaction that are going through two people at the same time um, in relation to the conversation that's going on is something that could revolutionize pretty much every field. Um, oh, this is what I was saying. It's like we were saying before that we like to think that we're in control of our bodies. We like to think we're in control of a lot of things. We like to think that we can master consciousness, right? But to an extent, there's always this unconscious reliance on biomechanical data, right? And that leads to the belief that we're still discovering new regions of the brain. We're still discovering new capabilities. Um, and that leads to the belief that there will be more things that we're able to map neurologically. Um, but like you're saying, it's reliance on the unconscious. It's like, we think that we're in control of our bodies, but it's less like a body and it's more like we're kind of driving a car, running around trying to drive a car and trying to parse out what other cars are going to do. And then social media drama is road rage. Twitter is like a nest of roads. And that brings back to decentralization because if you think about decentralized data, it would be like quantum Twitter. <laughs> and that's where we are. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense. So like, uh, also like this whole thing about mapping out human behavior, right? Like, uh, sketching out this entire cognitive architecture for what, uh, how human behavior is, and using it for systems and better understanding how, you know, social cues and social dynamics work. It's it's a, an incredible thing of its own. I feel like you know, more like. If I, if I were to reduce it down, I feel like statistics and probability, maybe two of the most basic things are more often used. Like I was reading this um, Anil State paper yesterday about what consciousness theory are, you know, most, uh, um, uh, most likely opted by people. Uh, you know, majority people opted for uh, the predictive processing paradigm. Some people went for the IIT theories. You know, there were other things. So you could see uh, in some statistical way that we're trying to collect data and, you know, put it in and see people's interests. So that's also, you know, trying to what, you know, somewhat uh, uh, map out the influence architecture of how, you know, what, what kind of a theory has a different, you know, influential or implication on a particular human uh, mind, right? And that's true for physics and, you know, consciousness theories, because these are so widely discussed they're you know so embedded with popular culture that they're one and you know they're one and together like everyone knows what string theory is more or less or has heard of it it's because of this you know pop culture influence and if one is able to of course map it out you know it's again you know uh, you were talking about the financial trajectory going up if we figure out this loop mm -hmm. Literally the same thing, yeah. So it, it all just maps out to become this amazing uh, structure that you can just, you understand human behavior and if you understand how influence works and to some extent how the unconscious conflates with it, you have the key uh, to, to mapping out everything, as you were saying. Yeah. And then we get to this point of like, and this is something that's fascinating when we were just talking, when you're talking about things going up and I said to the moon, because that was immediately the meme that I related to it. And I think that memes have almost become a language in and of themselves, which is something that a lot of people have been saying for a while. Like you could go back to Gerard, you could go back to um, Dawkins. Um, but I think now to an extent, memes have evolved past any written definition for memes because memes mean something different to different groups of people based off of what memes they encounter from discovery algorithms. So it's like there really are so many different ways 
to map the information that an individual encounters over time, and then to map the decisions that that person makes, or even for yourself to map the decisions that you make in relation to the data that you encounter, that like we don't realize how much of our lives rely on unconscious intake of information. Um, and I don't think that there's necessarily a bad thing with just kind of going on autopilot. Like something I love to do is um, look at the Spotify recommended for you playlists, right? Because I like to think about how they're kind of doing those recommendations. Because I did a project in undergrad that was um, for data science, data visualization class, right? And they have on their API the recommendation and personalization, right? Yes, recommendation and personalization algorithm, information um, transfer, like protocols, right? Like you could think about um, HTTP, you could think about um, UDP, you could think about basically data packets and how information travels from one to another. But we now have that on multiple levels because we have the actual electronic information transfer, but then we also have the actual like, it's almost like what I was saying about the project that I did um, when I was in high school, which is that when you take out the preparatory information, like if I hadn't heard you for a few seconds and you had something that said something that was critical to the meaning of what you said, it's almost like the loss of a data packet. And it's fascinating to think of things like that because you could think about different analogies and even just like the use of language and how the same concepts are conveyed differently in different communities can tell us something about how the unconscious mind functions. And that can tell us something about how to best model trends in data or not even model, but how to best predict and how to best generate. Um, I don't know, not to say that there's necessarily a best, like I'm all for free speech and I'm all for the proliferation of data within context, right? Like, I think that you can't try to change something by constraining it because the more taboo something becomes to an extent, the more desirable it becomes later on when people start blaming their problems on not being able to have access to it. Like look at like the boom in alcohol sales after the prohibition or look at just in general, like people tend to be reactionary in a sense. And that all comes down to the theory of decision-making. Um, and that's something that now we have new ways of modeling, right? Like I'm not saying that old ways of modeling it or old theories are necessarily bad. I think that they're great starting points for understanding things. And this brings us back to the whole idea that I said that I think that we're gonna have another church turn thesis at some point. Um, or even we'll have an extension of Chomsky, we'll have an extension of Lacan, we'll have an extension of all these different theories of languages. And then I think that everything does converge to an extent. Like even in understanding the basic functions of the brain, that can tell us something about how to make complementary technology um, to essentially accentuate the features that differentiate us from the technology itself. Because I think a big problem, and this kind of, it's ironic that this I could also characterize as alignment, because it really is alignment in a sense. We're kind of shaping society into different niches and pushing people based off of their past trends. And this is why I think that we need to have more parallel research. And I think this is kind of going on now, which is a good thing, between sociological um, data analysis and technological development, right? Because when you have um, basically the concurrent development of the technologies that we use and our understanding of the demographics that they're gonna serve. Um, and then also if we could do policy research, all aided by AI, right? All these things, then we can inform, better inform the architectures that we're using to research these things in the future. And then we could have better um, policies that service the communities that they're intended to service um, based off of that data and based off of the analytics that we get, even from decentralized voting, right? I don't know. I'm excited for the convergence of a lot of different trajectories of technological developments in the near future. That's basically the takeaway from that. <laughs> well, me too. And like one of the things that I was thinking, you know, you were talking about this reactionary nature that humans have, right? Like this, this lack that happens and then all of a sudden you want this, this lack. You know, the desires driven towards the slack. This is this, you know, very psychical question. And so what if, as we're trying to, you know, computationalize and structurize uh, or put into cognitive uh, maps, you know, human behavior, what if we're actually able to, in, you know, decipher some of these human behavioral questions? Like, what if there's a 
you know, there's some sort of a weird side effect that happens that in all, like in, we, we use human behavior to try to understand compu computation, but it has a reactionary effect. Like we end up actually understanding human behavior more uh, you know, through via computation and vice versa, like it's it's a it's a weird ongoing chain of thing that could potentially happen, and and so that's you know again you know the beauty of what you were saying, the beauty of uh, psychoanalysis and computation coming together, and you know we us having this topological structure finally, and so we get to understand this you know creation of humans, which is this you know cyberspace, this this uh, this computer computer world, and but we also get to understand our own nature and our our own human psyche. So I feel like the, the the confluence is definitely very very beautiful. Like, what hopes do you have for the future? Like, with the like, you, do you plan to uh, do any more research into you know, let's say psychoanalysis? Like, psycholinguistics, I see was one in one one of your uh, main fields, right? So I I feel like you know this this conflation between the two could be very fruitful, as as you know has been emphasized enough already. Yeah. So oh, it's, it's fascinating because my background, I actually was recently doing natural language processing research um, at MIT, but I recently actually um, left to start something ideally within the decentralization space, but also I'm doing a bunch of other projects at the same time, including this, which we actually recently spoke about. And I'm not saying that I'm committing to anything necessarily as the final version of the ideas, um, but I just have a lot of hope for the convergences of different areas, namely language, economics, um, multimodal data, um, AI, but also AI on decentralized data, um, compositionality, um, and also just like different aspects of like the decentralized self, right? Like people talk about these terms like the metaverse or these terms like, um, well, even inflation has come to be used in different contexts, like even if you look at Twitter trends, right? Um, and I don't know, I think that in terms of like sociological change, there will be a lot to be found with the current speed of information proliferation at the intersection of fields that think that they're finished, but only think that they finished because they work to some degree. Like for instance, contemporary economics, um, I don't know, and or even like contemporary politics or current political systems. I think we've reached a point, um, especially after the pandemic and our healthcare systems, like I think we have a lot going into fixing things that we now recognize could pose us um, for destructive events if we don't regularly upkeep, right? And I think that that's where we're kind of seeing decentralized technologies pop up and the use of blockchain pop up because there's this um, aspect of transparency and this aspect of being able to almost retrace your steps, um, which to a human creates a greater level of trust, but also in terms of what we can know from data and from ledgers and what we can use to drive decisions moving forward, it increases like it increases more than tenfold, like the the amount that we can actually decipher from history, um, recent history in terms of like the actual transactions. Um, and I don't know, there are good things to that and there are bad things to that, but I, I don't know. I don't like to assign labels as good or bad to that. I just am excited for the progress in the field and I'm excited for the convergences and the confluence, like you said. Um, but I also think that there is a lot of there's a lot of just like misinformation going around as well but that's going to be a natural symptom whenever you have things that are evolving at such a rate that attack vectors emerge um basically between the wires um and i think that spaces like decentralization spaces like um online transactions spaces like even even like what we were talking about before with methods of like drug delivery or um, even within areas like biomechanics and within um, areas like even like the human brain, um, brain machine interface. Like, of course, we're gonna have conversations about the ethical implications of things, but at some point somebody's going to do it, right? So thinking about how we're gonna do it is something that's fascinating and thinking about what we could garner from the data that we currently have um, 
even just like on a global scale and understanding the differences in trends and the differences in outcomes, um, not on an individual level, but in terms of like a global political level, even in terms of um, preparedness for the pandemic, I think could be hugely influential in where we end up um, 10 years from now, 30 years from now. Um, and the decisions that we make basically having learned from what we've observed over the past two years um, in terms of what we want and what we wish we had for data, maybe in the beginning of 2019 already in place, um, could determine whether or not we're prepared for the next thing. I don't think the next thing is gonna be a pandemic. I think that maybe cybersecurity is our biggest issue, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm one to speak on any of this. I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm bullish on the intersection of theoretical understanding of the unconscious, theoretical understanding of language, quantum information theory, um, and natural language processing. That's, that's what I'll say. You know, I was thinking about infodemics, right? And like infographics and stuff like that. And uh, also, you know, maybe one of the things that if we bring together Lacan's, uh, you know, topology or Lacan's just psychology in general, it's a Lacanian psychoanalysis with computation. You know, we can solve deeper intricate problems of, um, you know, info, infographic uh, and misinformation in the sense that like, if we look at, um, Theoretically speaking, if you look at like Lacan's concept of the real, right, which is this intolerable reality that we, you know, it's it's so intolerable that we we are always somewhere between the symbolic and the imaginary and somewhat in the real, you know, this uh, triad that Lacan introduces, right? And so if you were to take that real, which is this chaotic, you know, intolerable truth, and we compare it to our today's situation, today's social context, right? It's in misinformation. There's no concept of the real there's no truth like we see two sides we see different perspectives like there's so many things right and so if we look at this way and if we try to bring you know this theoretical understanding with some sort of a you know cognitive structure or computational structure we can solve like these intricate problems of how misinformation you know actually kind of penetrates the human psyche and functions within the different influences that human uh, you know tend to have like you know th these intricate problems could actually be solved if we actually bring you know as we were talking about before like these two worlds together like we can actually crack down the psychology of misinformation yes and i think that there's a lot going into like public sourcing ai competitions for studying data on misinformation um like, I think that Twitter actually earlier last year started a new team for basically discourse health, which is fascinating because it's like you could draw some equivalence, um, even using category theory or set theory between um, psychological health, health of discourse and interactions that an individual has and physical health, right? And we now have data in all three categories. And I don't know, I think that we're due for another almost concurrent enlightenment and romantic period. We're due for a lot more creativity, but we're also due for a lot more analysis. And we're due for a lot more people who can do both. <laughs> I will say that. And I, it's it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Like I really sincerely enjoyed, you know, and discussing everything here with you. It was like, you know, flowing of ideas. Like we almost are able to, we, I think we laid out the objectives of, you know, mapping out Lacanian topology with computation. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I like, I don't know. I haven't kept certain things updated. I always feel weird about the concept of internet presence. Like I don't want to extend this too long, but it's literally, it was something I wanted to bring up earlier when you were talking about shadow selves, because I kind of like to think of the internet as almost like a quantum platonic cave. If you know Plato's allegory of the cave, where we see the projections on the wall, it, prisoners see the projections of the wall, but they don't necessarily see the thing that casts it. And I think that you could draw connections between that as well as um, with what, almost like in a serious sense, um, Baudrillard is kind of making the case for in um, simulacra and simulation with the procession of simulacra, um, almost like in a series, like a generative series based off of past states of data, like if you think of it as a state machine. Um, and then you could also bring into that 
the idea, this is where the quantum part comes, which is the multiple channels of information, right? And the potential for superpositions um, of meaning and also of basically states. Um, and I think that basically on the internet, you don't have the whole of a person. You have the projection of what you called a shadow self, right? So people can craft their shadow selves in any which ways, right? Like the number of qualities through which you can personalize things on a given site are to an extent innumerable as long as you have a single text field. Um, but if you don't, if it's not with any text fields and it's all with like different types of options, then you do different combinatorials for how to compute that. But as long as you have a text field, then you pretty much have infinitely many ways to personalize something. And basically then think about all the different places where we choose ways to craft the shadow on the internet, right? So it's almost like a weighting problem where we can optimize for different traits that we want to convey. And there you get like social media marketing, you get influence, influencers, you get the creator economy, you get all these different things. Um, and then you get effects on markets from that. This goes back to what I was saying before, but pretty much this is what I kind of like to think of social media as, which is like, it's a quantum platonic cave because you could have the same person, the same node projecting different ways based off of how the light hits it. And that makes me sound very, very poetic, but also very, very nerdy. So I will end at that.